George, it's been a really interesting talk so far, but because of time constraints, um, I'd like you to tell me about um, the worst experience you had in terms of enemy fire, or um, if that didn't really happen, could you uh, tell us what happened at, um, when you were involved in Op Yurik? Um, I think that will be very interesting to the listeners. Yeah, the worst the worst was when I was on the ground with the uh, RAR and uh, that kind of action. Uh, and in the air, which was the worst one at, in terms of anti-aircraft fire or flak or anything like that? That was was at night when we'd go to um, generally Mozambique. We didn't, I, I didn't actually go at night to to Zambia. It was always to to Mozambique. And when we get a bit of course, or the pilot makes his 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 own way. You, you fly over the, the camp, you'd soon know about it because they, they, they were ready, they knew. You know, originally, uh, I believe they used to uh, use the power lines, uh, fly along the power lines. Uh, they got wise to that, use them uh, for navigation, um, railway lines. You know, you'd, you'd glance and, and in the middle of the night, you'd see these flashes and then you get to the door and look out and there was just all sorts of, of they, they start as red dots. Um, just red dots, and they're not kind of moving. But then the next thing, they come past you, uh, and those are the tracers that that they're firing. Yeah, and then obviously Shabani, we got a hit a couple of times uh, with the fuel tanks. The one time I was actually jumping, uh, I was doing a training jump myself uh, while we at uh, on fire force at, at Shabani, we'd gone down to uh, Rutenga to bring shoots back and uh, asked for permission to jump. And I said, oh, take me two thousand feet. Please, sir. And say, yeah, sure. Then um, we would, as as we go, there was a, a rise, and as we'd go over, yeah, there was, we were getting all sorts of, of hits. And, and I re- never forget the one guy who came with, he wasn't working in the kitchen. He was some, somewhere around like that. But, and he said, and you're going to jump out and that? I say, oh, sure, man. No, please, we'll be, you know. Anyway, and the pilot jumped, uh, left, uh, let me jump uh, quite away because of the height, and I was drifting a lot. Actually, they they were circling me, and I thought, why are they circling me? And the next thing, I look, and I'm going straight into power lines. And it's a, it, to be honest, it's the first time in my life that I'd say, please. I looked up, and I said, please, Lord, blow, blow. And I actually had to pull on my lift webs and lift my legs, and we went over these power lines. Um, anyway, landed. And I landed around about, two, there were only two huts, so, but I demolished the chicken run. And there were chickens everywhere. And the door of the hut bursts open. And this old black guy looks. He looks at me. He looks up. He sees the deck. And he stands to attention. Salutes. And he rattled off his service number. And he would had been in the war right, right in the early days. Uh, sure. There by India. Uh, uh, or, or Malaya. Malaya. Yeah, he was he was magic, and and he didn't give a damn that I demolished his chicken run. He was just so pleased to help me get get the shoot untangled and stuff. <laughs> yeah, regularly we used to take take a few rounds, and they'd just put a patch. You know, plan going for repair. Just put a, put an aluminium patch on. Okay, back out again. Uh, it was yeah, it just sort of like just became normal kind of stuff. We had a deck that flew in the battle on him. I was just going to say that. I wonder if some of our international views are aware of that. Yeah, yeah. we had a, black, a deck, and that had a, 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 a two rows of patches when you got in and you, and you went between the, 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 the benches to, towards the, the cockpit. There was just two rows of patches all the way down the floor, and that was anti-aircraft gun from, I'm not sure if it was on them, but from, from those days. And it just, yeah. So we had, yeah, we had quite a few patched uh, planes. Yeah, then... We, we went, beginning of September, uh, we were on Fire Force, uh, and uh, I think it was Centenary, but we got called back to Salisbury. It, it happened regularly. I mean, we, w- we were never, ever not busy. It was, it was that, or it was operations where you would, they would pull the entire Fire Force and we'd go somewhere to do something, uh, which lasted maybe two days, three days, and then you went back to the Fire Force. But uh, this occasion, we went to Salisbury, and we were there for the afternoon, and then we left late, and we got to Cherezi, and I just went like, whoa, the amount of aircraft and, and troops and stuff that I saw was the biggest I ever saw. Um, 
And I'll never forget getting out. Luckily, Greer was with me again, and he knew aircraft. And he just said, hey, those are super free lawns, super free lawns. And this thing opened up. There was drums of fuel. Uh, I think a Land Rover or two came out of it. I mean, it was incredible. It was incredible. And the amount of decks, South African decks, uh, the, the, the amount of decks, oh, I must have counted a good 25 plus. Um, and everyone there. And we thought, well, hey, okay. Because you never knew what, what was going on. And then that evening, General Walls briefed us on the, uh, on the map, and he said, right, fine. Uh, I'll never forget, I think we, we were allocated to Barajem, but the main worry was that all the, the gathering of aircraft would be spotted, uh, I don't know, by, by a satellite, or, or if, if, if they even had, but they were very worried about the, because it would draw their attention. That night it rained, it poured down, and uh, got delayed, got delayed. There was a, there were, there were some decks there, but they were called Dolphin. The call sign was Dolphin. And they actually had telex. I remember we had to go in there. They actually had telexes. And they had telexes on board. And they had tables. And it didn't look like a like the normal internal deck. This was, that, this was a, a full-on office. That was General Walls's plane, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I, I just assumed that it was because uh, he was going to be up there. And they were relaying. Uh, well, and there was also obviously uh, to relay messages and stuff uh, and information on, on progress on what was going on. Shortly, we took off on the map. There was a swamp. Must have been scouts or someone that had gone out, gone ahead, and they realised that the swamps are not swamps anymore. And but they denoted on the on the map, um, and they dried up, and that was where we put all the fuel. Because all the, the, the choppers, you know, you could carry a full load of fuel and no troops or troops and a, a lot less fuel. So we needed fuel for, for uh, all, the, all the choppers uh, to refuel. And we headed in there to Berejim with the uh, troops. And uh, we didn't come across any, any, any resistance, any fire or anything like that. And it was quite a clean drop and, and the, the weather wasn't good. You couldn't see anything. Uh, with the clouds. Roger, what, what was it like looking out the door at that huge armada of aircraft? Well, not huge by international standards, but certainly by African. I believe there were 50-odd helicopters involved as well. And um, so we look, we're looking at 75 aircraft, which is a lot for a little country. Did you get a view of that? Did you actually see the accompanying yes. aircraft? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, not not, not while, while we were uh, flying over, but... Yeah. Uh, uh, there at Cherezi, I mean, Cherezi is small strip, call it, and and to to I mean just to make space for that amount of aircraft and and fuel, and and personnel was, you know, we got there we didn't have anywhere we were going to sleep or anything like that. We actually managed to find I think it was their recreation room, climb through the window there and sleep on the couch. <laughs> but um, yeah, especially those super freelance. But they didn't go. They didn't go on the. Op they actually went. They, they, they ferried in uh, the fuel. equipment, uh, vehicle, equipment, and stuff like that. Um, and they they disappeared back. There were Can uh, Canberra's also from, from uh, SA, SA Canberra's. Yeah, there was a lot of, of ammunition, uh, uh, armaments, uh, armorers. You know, Tony, what I also wanted to, to, to enlighten everyone that uh, these ops, fire forces, Externals, the amount of, of preparation and work behind them and moving of, of the, the logistics to put them together, even, even just on a fire force, the kind of shoots, as, as I said, every single day, sometimes, except for one day, uh, sometimes two, two, two times a, a day, we go through a lot of shoots and uh, they need to be replenished. So we'd have night stops back, the deck would go back to collect at night shoots plus uh, whatever was needed. We used to carry armaments for the, the links. He also would go through a hell of a lot of ammunition. There was there was so, so much. You know, everyone does hear, uh, you know, about the action and, and things that are going on. You, you've got to, rip the, the amount of, of ammunition that, that troops have to be supplied with uh, has to come from somewhere. Don't know where I got it from, but I actually got a copy of the actual orders of Op Burek. And um, it was like, 25 pages long 
And, you know, all the, the movements, the timings, the destination, the what ifs, what is plan B, it was incredibly well done, very professional. One thing, as I said, they, they, they were a polished uh, uh, operation. When you see how, when, when I look back now about how they put things together, you know, the fact that they, they didn't have communications like you have today. You didn't have uh, Google Earth. You didn't have all sorts. I still, I still remember smiling and, and laughing at, uh, what did they call them, the monitoring force? Yes. The monitoring <laughs> with, force. With their little white yeah. crosses on, yeah. Nice yeah, 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 yeah. Those guys, uh, let alone them getting hammered at the nightclubs at Cockdoor and, and Round Bar. Uh, yep, they got when I say hammered, they weren't not from the, the Mount of Beers, from, from the agro, from us, uh, because they came in there. Oh, we have to sort out your situation. Yeah, well, yeah, uh, yo, they've got sort out. Lord Soames came, oh, it was Soames, he came with a VC 10, only one I ever saw. Uh, the first weekend, the VC-10, Kezivac, uh, power load back there. But they weren't Kezivac because of, of any military uh, operations or anything like that. They were Kezivac because of the night, uh, how they got sorted out in the nightclubs. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I'll never forget, we came, we came back from the from, from jumping at, at Serum. And we were coming up, up the road, and we used to lie on the back of the truck on top of all the shoots, used shoots. And... Um, those guys from, I think they were Scottish because they all had kilts on and they had white, pink, luminous white legs and long socks. <laughs> and, one of the, and they were marching down, coming out of the security area of the New Zealand. And I'll never forget that uh, one of the, uh, the guys on the, on, on a truck, yeah, they started wolf whistling at them in, the, in their kilts and their pink, <laughs> luminous legs. And we used to rip them to hell, to shreds. I mean, the classic was a Bobby with his baton sitting out in the TTL. You know, I wasn't really uh, a bush or an orientated guy. Uh, my father never took me fishing or anything. Uh, he was he was sport sport mad. He was mm -hmm. uh, training us, and we would do nonstop sport. So for me, national service and you was was something. I you know, but anyway, um, I'm so proud and and happy. Even though my my part was was small, but um, I got to 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 work really hard on the logistics of stuff, loading stuff, doing stuff. I fortunately managed to to see action uh, with the RAR. Oh, it's, it's brilliant, Rod. You did your bit, and um, you know logistics is one of my favourite subjects actually. And um, I'm amazed. I've studied the German army a lot, and how they managed to keep 11 million men in the field fed watered and full of ammo every day. How did they do that? How did any large army logistics? Yeah. I would very much like to interview one of our colonels, brigadiers, or whatever, who is involved in logistics in Rhodesia and speak to him. Because yeah, of... it was, we, we even had our own squadron for, for dropping supplies. I yeah. forget what they were called. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I, I know I, the one. Yeah. 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 I went, uh, uh, oh, jeez, air transport. Something like that, yeah, eight, but, yeah, eight years or something. Like, yeah, like you say, I, um, my my grandfather uh, in the UK, he lied about his age when he was seventeen, so he could get into the army. Got in there, um, and then uh, had his training, and they sent him straight to the Battle of the Somme, mm -hmm. straight to the front line in the trenches. And he would tell me that they had little railway lines built mm -hmm. there and mm -hmm. transporting all that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, you know, it. it Rhodesia, not only did they, they provide uh, agriculture and, and minerals for the world, um, they, they produced a hell of a lot of, of good people and uh, they could plan and fight. And um, a, a very efficient, uh, a very efficient little country, no doubt about that. One of the guys we've had on this series, uh, he's a New Zealander or an Australian, I forget his name now, from the Special Forces. He said he just couldn't get over how efficient the country was, you know, that if a, a pothole developed with, within three or four days, this is out in the, the, the bush, it would be filled in. And that was during the war with, um, it's all over the place. Yeah, yeah, building, building, the, the, the strips that they built throughout the entire country because uh, choppers need to be refueled um, if it was a long contact, I mean, and... Uh, 
obviously that needed to land and be handy and ready mm. uh, for Kazavaks and taking captures, weapons, everything. Um, yeah, they and they built a. They, they had a. They, that's another subject of of um, civil works that department mm. of providing that those facilities for the troops. Um, sure. I think it was uh, an amazing little army and an amazing little air force and. You know, the guys did the most incredible technical things. I believe we even made our own blades for the engines on the hunters. I just That's really advanced stuff. And everybody, because of sanctions, just stepped forward, learned how to do it, and got on with it. I know a friend of mine stole some stuff from, from the South African Air Force because he was a technician, fitter type of guy, and he stole something that made it easier for the hunters to drop their bombs quicker. <laughs> so you know there was there was all yeah. sorts of stuff and uh, Roger it's been a wonderful talk really interesting I'm sure the people out there will enjoy it and um, I think you'll agree that it's not that hard doing your talk is it no no you know I, I would I would urge urge guys to come forward uh, you know like like you actually mentioned you actually have doubts before before the the chat that uh, you didn't do enough. You your your yeah. role wasn't the kind of guys you've had on are, are yeah really fantastic and 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 so so um, interesting and unbelievably brave. Um, so you really feel in, insignificant mm. and oh, you know what people will laugh at me and stuff. Mm. Um, but but it. Everyone's got a story to tell, Absolutely. and uh, I would urge guys to to and I'll I'll come up with a few names that I'll contact. Um, yeah, to tell them, hey guys, you know, um, and it's so for ladies, civilians, you know, people who experienced the war. Um, even if some WBS ladies gave a ten minute talk each, we can stitch them together in a half an hour presentation. They were wonderful ladies. I mean. Oh, I, I was I actually had notes here to say that we would get off um, and obviously I'd start hitchhiking. You know, some of us would start hitchhiking towards uh, Bulawayo and you get to Hartley. And, stuff. Mm. And, and you saw painted on the side of this wall, Horses Canteen. Mm. They Marvelous produced thing. burgers and yeah. stuff for the guys. Yeah. I remember landing... Mangula. Mm. It landed Mangula for Fire Force, start, set up a Fire Force, and within uh, half an hour to 45 minutes, mm. farmers' wives would arrive. Yeah. And they would bring watermelons, yeah. cakes. They, 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 they were looked amazing. Off, yeah. They looked after the guys. And the woman, yeah, the woman had a big, big part of it. I know in our safety, safety equipment section at New Serum was, mm. was, uh, had a hang of a lot of women mm. fixing fixing the shoots, uh, putting them back together, uh, packing them. They're far and, better with their hands than men are. Actually, they're more dexterous and attention to detail. Farmers' wives were incredible, and the um, forces canteen. I, yeah. I, I'd love to hear the stories of the of the ladies. Oh uh, yeah, the canteen. Um, that, just to that, just to end on that note, we were called out in the middle of the night from the School of Infantry to go to Shabani, Shangani, I don't know where it was. But we arrived at there at one or two in the morning, about a company of us. And all the ladies had come out of their warm beds, uh, driven through the night, endangering themselves to get to the hall where they met us. And they gave us the most incredible burgers, Cokes. Now, that, that, uh, take, that takes chutzpah, you know, mm. and uh, I really respect them. You know what I need to tell you? Yeah. About this pilot we had, Bob Dotman. Bob Dotman and I got on well. He, he really enjoyed me. So I remember flying to, to Mukumbura with him. Me and another, um, the other discussion. We went to Mukumbura. And at Mukumbura, they, we were doing uh, uh, dropping stuff off. They said, listen, will you give this uh, uh, guy a lift back? He's riding his bicycle to Salisbury. So if you can give him a lift back to Darwin, it's, it's closer than here. And it's a bit, a bit safer. We said, sure. And this guy arrives, this black guy, um, permanent force, and he was dressed in his suit, dressed to the nines, and his bicycle, and on the back of the bicycle carrier, he had a cage with a chicken in it. And he'd never flown before. So we stuck him in the, put him in there with his bicycle and everything, and he was 
<laughs> really scared. And then I remember going to, to, to Bob Dockman and say, sir, can you make us wait this? And he was the only one who didn't have that much respect for a DAC. He would rip the wings off that thing, whereas everyone else was really gentle with him. And, and he said, yeah, sure. So anyway, he, I went to the back. He said, just uh, uh, put the seatbelt on that guy. I said, yeah, yeah, sure, sir. Anyway, and we, I went to the back and said to the other guy, okay, fine, I'm going to go weightless. And we were like, never. And then next thing, this thing, we started pulling Gs, and the engines were screaming, and we'll go up, and then <clears throat> we'll be forced on the floor, and then the next thing, you start going light, and, we, and the next thing, you start floating. And Dotman had a, to a T where he could do that big, big arc. So you stayed weightless for quite some time, which was great. It was great. This poor elderly black guy's eyes saw these guys floating around in front of him. <laughs> And the worst, uh, the next thing, his bicycle is also floating around. <laughs> well, his face, and the next thing, the chicken cage comes <laughs> off the bicycle, and the chicken cage for, for a short yeah. period. <laughs> anyway, and we came down, crashed on the floor, and then he did it again. And it was the best experience. At the end of, of my service, we were training the next dispatchers to take over. And they were they were just learning. So the, the, the officers and sergeants were that side of, of PTS and us guys this side. And I saw uh, the pilots came in and it's Bob Dortman. I said, hey, sir, hey, I said, Beryl, how are you, Beryl? I said, fine. I said, sir, can you make us weightless? He says, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just ask, just ask your lieutenant. Yeah, yeah, for sure, sir. And Lieutenant Milligan, he, he was busy and he didn't hear me, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't answer me. And the next thing, we just taken off and I saw the, the Bob Dotman look back and I just said, oh, great. Not knowing what was going to happen because it was a Friday, I remember. And then as we stand up and hook up, stand up, hook up, check equipment, the next thing, the deck engines start screaming and we're taking big G's like that and we hardly can stand in our shoots and the next thing we start to float and all of us, those guys were still seated but they didn't have their seatbelts on and they didn't know no one knew other than me and the next thing we're floating and we're floating around <laughs> and these dispatchers luckily, luckily they because they were beginners they had their, their monkey belts uh, hooked onto the deck but but I remember some of the, 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 the officers, they had bald heads, and they shot up and hit <laughs> the ceiling. They were stuck on the ceiling like this. And then we came down, we crashed down, eight, eight of us on the floor, and, well, and that side, and, and we just managed to get up. Now, you, you're really tight for space, and he does it again, and he does it again. And no one had an idea. And uh, anyway, I was off for the weekend. So I got back. I thought, oh, this was the greatest fun I ever had in my life. And um, I took off hitchhiking and uh, the <laughs> uh, squadron leader hells goes over to three squadron. And there's hell. They heard what had happened. And they wanted to know. So Bob Dotman just says, no, nah, the barrel said I can do it. And they looked. Speechless, because because the other guy told me uh, who was there. Oh, the F is a barrel to say that you can blah blah blah. And old Dotman, Dotman was was the old school guy. He just, you know, and it was water for ducks back. But <laughs> I was I was out of there for the weekend. By the time I got back, all was forgotten. Um, but Dotman also, also used to beat up the camp every time we took off, and we loved it. And, but he was the only one. <laughs> excellent stories excellent. and an excellent story to end on. Um, but we're going to have to call it quits now. Um, great chatting to you, Roger. Uh, have a good day for the rest of the day, won't you? You too. Thanks, Thanks so much for your time and all your all your good work. Please tell all the guys you know behind you or with you yeah. on the channel. Will do. Thank you, it's, Roger. It's great. Take Bye. care, buddy.